the all available information on President, over. As history and tragedy were unfolding at Dealey Plaza, radio and telephone communications squawked between the Air Force Command Center, the White House, and Air Force One. Wayside, this is uh, Situation Room. I read uh, from the AP bulletin, uh, Kennedy apparently shot in head. He fell face down in back seat of his car. Blood was on his head. Mrs. Kennedy cried, oh no, and tried to hold up his head. Earlier this year, these rare audio recordings were discovered in the personal effects of General Chester Clifton Jr., a military aide to President John F. Kennedy. They want a post-mortem that needs to be done under law at Walter Reed. Forensic audio and video expert Ed Primo was tasked with remastering and piecing together the new tape with older, incomplete copies. It's spine tingling. It's, it gives you goosebumps when you listen to it. The result is an unflinching account of history unfolding in real time. That is correct. That is correct. We're hearing several commanders communicating logistical information about interrupting everybody's plans because the president was assassinated and what it's going to take to get them to all come together and deal with this disaster. The president is on board. The body is on board. The whole family is on board. On the tapes, you can hear the military using code names. LBJ is volunteer. We're waiting for the swearing in at the plane before takeoff. Up the, that's the volunteer? Pleasure. That swearing in aboard Air Force One produced this iconic image of LBJ with a shaken Jackie Kennedy by his side. And after Air Force One was in the air, crews could be heard scrambling to sort out logistics. You can even hear LBJ passing on condolences to JFK's mother, Rose Kennedy. To Primo, just as interesting as what is on the tapes is what is not. There are a number of obvious edits. I think it's pretty simple. Whoever created the tapes had certain parts of the conversations they didn't want anybody to hear. I welcome this kind of examination. Round up the usual suspects. They are who we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. Do it live. I can, I'll write it, and we'll do it live. You know, they do this to me all the time. I don't know what the hell they do it for, but God damn it, if we can't come out of a slow record, I don't understand it. He's down on the phone. That it is immoral and wrong that the top one-tenth of one percent in this country own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. They will note merely that I was among the senators who determined that what the president did was wrong. Meeting in the middle of the desert always made me nervous. It's a scary place. Who ever told you that you could work with men? If ISIS started a streaming service, you'd call your agent. And for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. It's morning again in America. This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is Randy Benson. You're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing and traversing to the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, the court historians, and the textbook conglomerates to control information today. Well, tonight we have episode 181. Oh my gosh, 19 episodes until episode 200. That's uh, that's real interesting. When I started the show, I didn't even know if we would get past three episodes. So here we are at episode 181, Rick Russo on JFK and Bethesda, Lies, Deception, and Misdirection. Our guest tonight is the wonderful JFK researcher Rick Russo. First, however, let us clean this castle if we may. 
next week, issue 15 of Garrison, the Journal of History and Deep Politics. It's the all JFK issue for the 60th anniversary, which, by the way, is today. And yes, I'm quite aware. I know that it was supposed to be available by now. It was supposed to be available actually at the beginning of the month. But uh, what started as an approximately 125 page issue of the magazine has turned into twice that. It, It will be well over 250 pages in length. So it took a tad bit longer than I'd hoped to lay it out. My apologies. There was nothing I could really do about that. But uh, be looking for that next week because it will be out. And it is a really strong issue. We'll be right back with Rick Russo. This is Peter Janney, author of Mary's Mosaic, the CIA conspiracy to murder John F. Kennedy, Mary Pincho Meyer, and their vision for world peace. For more on the murders of a president, and a well-connected Washington, D.C. socialite, and an ideal shared by both. Listen to episode 81 of the Midnight Rider News Show. Now, I first became aware of Rick Russo through my friend Ed Tatro. As many of you know, I consider Ed Tatro to be the most knowledgeable researcher in this field and the one with the widest range of information. It's talking to ed is like talking to an encyclopedia of the jfk assassination it is amazing and i mean if there's someone whose name you have heard of in this field even sort of tangentially over the past 60 years that there's pretty good odds that ed has either written that person or had email exchanges with that person and uh, multiple times. And because of those exchanges, Ed really has first information, first hand information that no one else has because he's had direct contact with them. So I trust Ed implicitly on this case. So when Ed came to me and told me about the expertise of his friend Rick Russo, my ears perked up immediately. Of course I would like to speak with him. Of course I would like to figure out just how he could share his expertise with everyone out there. Of course. So, here we are tonight. And we'll be talking about JFK and Bethesda, lies, deception, and misdirection. Rick Russo, how are you doing this evening? Good, yourself? I am well. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, I'd like to start, actually, before we get into JFK at Bethesda and all the shenanigans that happened there, uh, I would like to begin with a little bit about Rick Russo, a little bit about how you got into the case and your sort of history with the case, if you would. Well, uh, basically, for me, my um, involvement with this subject matter began in uh, quite by accident, September 1991. When I came across a uh, documentary series on A and E called Investigative Reports, and uh, under that title, you know, was uh, five hours of a, a show called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Now, at that time, I thought that this was something that was actually produced by A and E Network, and Bill Curtis was the narrator. And, and and what really you know blew me away was the fact that. Uh, the substance and content and, and the eyewitness accounts that were on this series uh, were the kind of thing that we really didn't get from our own mainstream you know, media. And then uh, sometime later on, I found out that it was, in fact, a British documentary series that had been produced uh, for the 25th anniversary in 1988. And uh, being in the video distribution business at the time, I actually looked into see if the uh, video rights for this series was available as it turned out it was and and uh, i licensed it and then um that's where my journey or adventure began uh then uh then uh at at that point after having acquired the rights i felt a responsibility to understand the subject matter and and uh because right after that it aired on on a and e then the jfk movie in december uh, came out and and then we had what became a renaissance, if you may, of, of the subject of the JFK assassination. So I started to try to educate myself more. And one of the people who were principals uh, in that Men Who Killed Kennedy uh, series was a man by the name of Gary Mack, who informed me that right in my own backyard was a researcher that I should contact uh, by the name of Ed Tatro. And that was the beginning of what turned out to be not only a, a, a 31 year friendship, but also a, a research partnership. So, um, 
so fall of 91 is how I kind of fell into this whole thing. And then um, in May of 1992, the Journal of the AMA had a press conference in New York. And basically what they were saying is that we have these two doctors, Jung's and Boswell, uh, who were the only ones there and who knew what really happened. And the, there was just two shots from behind by one gunman in the 6th floor of the, of the depository. And, um, and that kind of infuriated, uh, me, not only myself, but a number of other people, uh, uh, that, that brought about something that then happened a few months later in December, I was able to have a gathering in Pittsburgh of five of the men who were actually at Bethesda that night. And, uh, and also including Cyril Wecht, who was a forensic pathologist and uh, a radiologist, uh, Randy Robertson. So um, I did this not as some investigation or because I was an author looking for information to put into a book. I was doing it solely uh, as a catharsis for these men to get them together after all those years. And, and that's what it ended up being. And some very interesting information came out of that. Uh, uh, one of the things at the very end, when I asked everybody to, have you had an anecdote that we weren't aware of something we didn't know beforehand. Dennis David started telling the story of uh, a close friend of his, William Pitzer, who uh, was uh, found dead in his office at Bethesda and had been involved with uh, some uh, materials pertaining to the uh, autopsy. And then uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I brought to Pittsburgh with me, a man by the name of Mark Crouch, who was a researcher and had developed a relationship with a former Secret Service man by the name of James Fox, who had images of uh, the president's autopsy, at least that's what we felt at the time. Uh, he provided me a copy of these photographs, uh, which we then had the men in Pittsburgh discuss among themselves. And I told him, uh, at some point, if you want to call in and ask a question, uh, I'm sure, you know, the men would be happy to answer anything you ask. And so when he called in, one of the things he asked is about a man called Robert Knudsen, who had stated uh, in a uh, popular uh, photography magazine in 1975 that uh, he was the sole photographer of uh, the president's autopsy and was the hardest thing he ever had to do. And when I posed that question to Floyd Reby, who was one of the photographers at the autopsy, he says, never heard of the man. He wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about. So that's how the Knudsen story started, uh, you know, in that situation. Uh, a few months later, 1993, in the spring, a man by the name of Doug Carlson uh, put together, which I think to this day is probably the most important uh, conference ever put together on the JFK assassination. It took place in Chicago. And I flew out there because once again, I was a neophyte in this subject, but I'm distributing a documentary series that I thought was very important. So I figured, you know, I should go out there, meet people, educate myself and, and learn more about the subject uh, as a whole. And the very last night of the conference, they had one of these chicken dinners and I'm sitting at a table with I, I didn't know anybody there, but uh, at the table were, was um, uh, Gary Aguilar, David Mantic, and to my right were two other gentlemen that looked like a throwback from the 70s, you know, a denim jacket, silver hair, ponytail, that kind of thing. And I told some of the people at the table that a few months earlier, I'd actually gathered these men from uh, Bethesda together for for uh, an interview and a gathering and all that. And the man to my right asked me, have you ever heard the name William Bruce Pitzer? Now that threw me for a loop because yes, I had just a few months earlier, Dennis David emotionally is telling the story about his friend. And here's somebody asking me if I had heard this name. And the reason he asked me because the area that he came from in upper state New York, there was a man, uh, Colonel Dan Marvin, who had told people that he had in fact been asked to kill a man by the name of William Bruce Pitzer. So that was the start of a whole other situation where 
Uh, when I got back home, I contacted Dennis David, told him about uh, the story. I had not met Marvin yet, but told him about the Marvin story. And for whatever reason, this seemed to be uh, a catalyst for Dennis wanting to actually be hypnotized so he could recall in more detail a situation that happened a few days after the assassination where he went to uh, you know, Mr. Pitcher's office and saw various photographic materials pertaining to, to, to the autopsy. So uh, in July of 93, I brought Dennis to, um, to be hypnotized in New York by Herbert Spiegel, who was one of the top in the country uh, in, in hypnotherapy and, and doing this kind of thing. And uh, I got to tell you, Hesity, I've never seen anything like this before. It, it turns out that Dennis David, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest susceptibility to, to hypnosis, was at the very top of the scale. And when he was put under, he went back in time 30 years in the first person. And he's talking about something as though he's seen it with his eyes right there in front of us. And so uh, needless to say, that session went very uh, successfully. And then uh, a few months later, because he had heard about it, Jim Jenkins also asked to be put under hypnosis. He wasn't as good a subject as Dennis, but, uh, you know, he was able to remember um, a number of very important details and ended up being in that uh, uh, book from a short time back that he wrote with William Law. So if anybody's interested, they could check that out and, and, and get more of that information. But um, during this period of time, Again, there's a thing called serendipity that's continued to happen in my life periodically, you know, where I would somehow or other find a witness or a witness would find me or something would happen that uh, would, would more or less drive me further on into uh, uh, the rabbit hole, if you may. And um, in, in 19, I think it was 94, 95, A&E had created a brand new channel called the History Channel. Now, their license with me was just for videos uh, to be sold um, uh, on A&E. So they had to redo things because of this new channel to be because they were going to bring the programming and the Medical Kennedy onto that. And so uh, part of the agreement in licensing, um, you know, the, the video for the History Channel is I told them, I think we should do a new episode that would help not only with the transfer of the show to the history channel, but also, you know, give you something to promote that was brand new. And that ended up being, um, how, uh, episode six, the true shall set you free ended up being, uh, produced. And, uh, we don't have the time or I'm not going to go into how I found Nigel Turner and how things came about, but, uh, nevertheless, uh, that's how that happened. And then uh, 1997, 98, sometime in that period, uh, I ended up uh, interviewing on the phone uh, a man by the name of Donald Rebetish, who was at Bethesda that night and uh, had been uh, part of uh, a group of men that received a casket that uh, came in. And then uh, moving forward to 2003, uh, Nigel contacted myself and Ed Tatro about being consultants on the 40th anniversary shows. Uh, now, to be honest, the 1995 show, and you know, it's only 45, uh, about 48 minutes, I was a little bit disappointed. You know, we had some terrific um, segments in it, but it certainly wasn't going to be any kind of definitive closure on the subject. All it did is bring some new information to light. But, uh, you know, there was still, to my mind, you know, no closure on things at that point. But for 2003, those episodes of Smoking Guns, and the one that Ed was so prominent in, uh, The Guilty Men, I think really brought things um, to to a, a whole new understanding and, and, and closure on the subject, for me anyway. And then, of course, you're, I'm sure, aware of the fact that it only took two weeks or so for then uh, former presidents and others connected uh, originally with LBJ uh, to force the network to basically pull them and the shows had been banned ever since. So uh, that brings us up to 2015 where something happened that um, basically 
brought me to re-examine the events of Bethesda. And, and, and also, by that time, uh, due to the work of the ARB, which released a lot of documents, and the internet, where these materials could finally be found and located very easily, it, it allowed me to then come across some information that uh, really motivated me to pursue, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the, uh, the events uh, of Bethesda once again. Well, let's go back to Dallas, November 22nd, 1963. We've been at Parkland. JFK has been pronounced dead. Um, LBJ is going to take the oath of office on Air Force One, and the body is about to be moved. Now, there's a little bit or a lot, according to the public sources that we have, uh, a lot of uncertainty about just where the body is going to go. You heard in the introduction of the CNN clip a little bit about it potentially going to Walter Reed. We know it ends up at Bethesda. But if you would take us through that process of just deciding where the body is going to go and how that decision was made. Well, as we've been told, uh, even though uh, the coroner of, uh, of, of Texas wanted to do the autopsy uh, right there at Parkland, but the Secret Service uh, refused and, and uh, a casket was ordered from O'Neill's funeral home. The body was uh, witnessed being put into that casket, um, actually by two men who worked for O'Neill, um, Aubrey Reich and his partner, uh, Dennis McGuire. And then uh, the casket was brought from Parkland to uh, Air Force One. And historically, this is our understanding of the of the events. Um, so uh, now, what I'm what I'm going to say is pure speculation because the one part of this whole equ equation, if you may, that's that's never really been answered, is if uh, and there is belief that the bronze casket that was in Air Force One, uh, the body was removed. And uh, and that's how it somehow found its way later on to Bethesda in a different manner than we had officially been told. But the question has always remained, how did the body, you know, get to Air Force One? Was it still in the casket or did it happen in another manner? And and one thing and I and I and I state that this is pure speculation and I can't I don't have a definitive answer for it, but. I believe that uh, the body was removed from the bronze casket while it was still sitting inside Parkland Hospital. And I think that uh, the casket being put into the uh, O'Neill hearse and officially drove, driven away in front of the media cameras, whatever, um, was misdirection. And I think that the body had then been put into uh, most likely a body bag and at that point in time, the media has given the story about not only was uh, a policeman, J.D. Tippett, shot and killed, but also a Secret Service man died that day. So the, uh, the news media is talking about a dead Secret Service agent for a number of hours that afternoon. And then the story later on is retracted. Well, why would they have given this story in the first place? And, and to me, it felt like a cover story that if someone were to witness uh, a body being removed from Parkland, say in a body bag, um, you know, then they would be able to say, well, this, this was a dead secret service agent who was also shot. Now, I don't know if you're aware of, of the story of Aubrey Reich, who was there earlier in, in the day um, and uh, remained at the hospital. And when the president's limousine uh, finally arrived, uh, his vehicle was right there in the very, you know, front of, of the uh, loading dock of the, uh, the back of the ER. And they told him, uh, and, th and this is his comments, the Warren Commission, Aubrey Wright, the, F the Secret Service man told him, leave your ambulance there. We may need it to remove the president's body to another hospital. Now, First of all, uh, Parkland was the number one trauma center in that whole area, 
and maybe even in that area of the country, not just Dallas and Fort Worth. So there was no other hospital to really bring him. Plus the fact that it was obvious to most people who saw the body that he was dead on arrival. Uh, so, you know, why was the secret service agent saying this? Uh, but then if a body in a body bag after the bronze casket and, and the white hearse had left is it, put into, um, Reich's vehicle ambulance, then, uh, perhaps he was just told it was a dead secret service agent. And that's how that body, uh, ultimately of the president was, uh, brought to, uh, Love Field and uh, put into another part of the airplane. Now, I don't know how wild that sounds to you, but, uh, you know, compared to stories that have come out over the years of the fact that the body was in the bronze casket that was put into the airport, brought off the ramp, you know, the uh, ramp and, and put into the plane. And then at some point, the body's taken out of the casket and put underneath the plane. Uh, that seems a lot more crazy and ludicrous to me. But um, in any event, the reason why I mentioned this about putting the body uh, in the underbelly of the plane, where there was a storage area, is that when uh, Air Force One finally arrives from Dallas, um, th there's an announcement, for instance, on uh, NBC News as the plane is arriving that um, the body of the president will be flown by helicopter, presumably to Bethesda Naval Hospital. So the media has already been told that. And we've heard from the Air Force One tapes about uh, the fact that uh, even though uh, Dr. Berkeley and General Clifton were in the process of already talking to General Heaton at uh, Walter Reed about uh, a legal autopsy being performed at his hospital, Berkeley is then told by the uh, White House Situation Room that arrangements have already been made by uh, the president's naval aide, uh, Captain Taswell Shepard, for the body to come to Bethesda. So we know, uh, we know on the audio tapes that this, this was the process that was going on. And in fact, uh, Roy Kellman, who later on, uh, asks for a conveyor lift uh, on the rear left-hand side of the plane, uh, and then also uh, a ramp in the right front of the plane uh, for Mrs. Kennedy to depart. Now, we know historically that she actually departs with the casket uh, in the right rear of the plane in that conveyor thing and gets into a Navy ambulance, whereas uh, Roy Kellerman and others on the Air Force One tapes are talking about uh, the Kennedy party and the body being flown by helicopter to Bethesda. So we have two scenarios going on here. Which one do we believe? Well, uh, a researcher by the name of Mark Crouch, uh, who was the one that befriended James Fox, who had those autopsy pictures we mentioned earlier. Uh, during the mid-90s, he was uh, giving presentations at various places like a Rotary Club, you know, in the area where he lived. And after one of his presentations, a man came up to him and basically told him that he had been at Andrews Air Force Base that night. He was an airman, and he was in one of the hangars off to the rear and the side behind the plane. And he had asked uh, his superior officer if they could go out on the tarmac to see the president's body being, you know, unloaded. Because that was the whole point of, uh, of Air Force One uh, flying to Andrews. And they were give, given permission. And at that point... They see that that the storage area in the right front underbelly of, of the plane uh, was opened up. And what they felt they were seeing was a body in a body bag being removed. And a short distance away from this is a helicopter with a what they felt was a body being put on the helicopter. And then the helicopter immediately flying uh, over the tarmac away from the plane. And the crazy thing that he said was the fact that they were flying so low, maybe three feet off the ground, that they thought the crazy son of a bitch was going to fly into one of the hangars. So obviously what we're hearing about here is something very clandestine. On one hand, on the side of the plane where the, uh, where the, you know, the, the spectators and onlookers and the media were taking film and photographs uh, of, of uh, a casket being unloaded and put into a gray Navy ambulance. On the other side, before that even happens, 
we have a body, what seems to be a body, uh, removed and put onto a helicopter, which then, uh, I believe, flew to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Right. Well, and at this point in the story, everyone out there should be thinking all this talk so far about multiple entrance and uh, entrances and multiple exits and and multiple spots on the plane and all these things. I don't really understand why it's all happening yet, but I do know that it is happening and we're about to get into the why of all of it as well. But I wanted to make sure that we hit the Walter Reed point because it is a story that's out there that that they were supposed to go to Walter Reed and that in route they uh, changed that location to Bethesda. What is the story behind that? Well, as I said, uh, it was in it was already in motion, and and Berkeley's already talking to Heaton over there, who's you know Walter Reed was one of the top places for uh, forensic pathology. You know, that seemed to be the obvious choice. But, uh, you know, a Navy man, uh, Tazewell Shepard, is in fact, and I, I believe he was working in concert with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, you know, they had made the determination and, uh, and arranged that the body was in actuality to be brought to Bethesda. And we have the whole romantic story about how, um, you know, um, Admiral Berkeley, uh, went over to Jackie Kennedy to ask where they should bring, bring the body. And she said, we should go to the Bethesda because he was a Navy man. Well, that, that it's romantic, but it's very silly because, uh, people had already, you know, going back to the white house had already made, uh, these decisions and had nothing to do with her. Well, let's sort of zoom in on the casket at this point for a few minutes. There was a lot of research in the 1980s, the early 1980s, that sort of made us look again at at the sort of course of the casket. What is it that we now know? Well, well, the the the, the thing that that came about in 1981 was the release of David Lifton's book, uh, Best Evidence, and he had learned various bits of information over the previous years that he hypothesized led to the a situation where at some point uh, President Kennedy's body had been removed from that Dallas bronze casket um, to, um, to do some kind of a secret uh, examination or alteration of the wounds uh, on the body uh, and that it had been uh, put into a shipping casket brought to Bethesda and then at some point in the evening when these alterations had been done, the body was put back into uh, the, you know, the original bronze casket, reunited with it, if you may, and then uh, and brought in at 8 o'clock. So that's, uh, that, that's what uh, David Lifton had been uh, you know, putting forth in his book. And, and over the years, it's been a matter uh, uh, of a great deal of debate you know, as far as the legitimacy of any of that. But um, <clears throat> uh, for me, uh, you know, we, we also um, have a situation where, okay, uh, the key figure in this whole double casket situation, ST, is a man by name of, we mentioned earlier, Dennis David who surfaced in 1975 and talked to a local newspaper paper about what he experienced. Lifton found out about it in 1979. And then in his book, uh, Dennis David's story appears in a chapter under the uh, title of the Lake County Informant. So they don't name Dennis David um, personally, but tell his story about the fact that uh, he, he and a group of his men received uh, a great shipping casket at the back of the morgue um, earlier in the evening uh, than when the uh, Gray Navy ambulance that, that was being driven, by the way, you know, so we so supposedly they forgot all about the fact that they wanted to helicopter the body and, and Jackie Kennedy to Bethesda. Instead, she's driving 40, 45 minutes, you know, uh, from the, uh, from Andrews to Bethesda with the casket in the back. So before she even arrives, this other casket that Dennis David has uh, witnessed uh, is brought in. And for David Lifton, this substantiates his, his hypothesis that in fact, you know, the body had been removed and, and so forth and so on. So, and then over subsequent years, we had uh, then the account of uh, 
Donald Rebentish. It's at the point where Lifton's book came out in, in early 1981, Time, Time Magazine did the whole story uh, reviewing it and basically talking about the elements and, that Lifton was putting forth. And a, by, a man by the name of Donald Rebentish was at uh, his job. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure you know, where it was. It might have been a, a plant of some sort auto plant but his his habit every every week was to get hit you know during his break food break or whatever he, he'd read his copy of time magazine he comes across this article about the about hypothesis of david lifton and the book best evidence and he gets very irritated by this because of the fact that he in fact was with a party that received the casket uh at bethesda that night and the whole idea of the body being stolen, if you may, for lack of better words, from the bronze casket uh, and put into a, a, a cheap shipping casket, um, in his mind, didn't wasn't even reality because he, in fact, was told late that afternoon that they would be receiving a, sh- a gray shipping casket with the president's body in it and that the, uh, the ambulance and the other casket was just a decoy. So... You know, this this bothered him to the point where he told a family member who then shortly after that tells a local reporter. And then after the local reporter um, uh, for the Grand Rapids, Michigan newspaper uh, is able to uh, determine uh, Rebentitious bona fides that he was actually at Bethesda at that point in time. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the reporter writes a story for, for that local newspaper that then uh, within a day or two goes national on the wire services. And I think it's important, if, if you don't mind, to read this, you know, as it was uh, written. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you the version that it was the UPI story on January 25th, 1981, that ran in the Miami Herald. And this is uh, what the story uh, stated. The coffin came through a rear freight entrance 30 to 40 minutes before the bronze casket arrived. Quote, it was a typical Navy gray shipping casket, just exactly as we expected. I helped take it out of the hearse, but then someone else came and took it upstairs. We put it on, and then he's going back. We put it on a gurney and wheeled it in, end quote. It was about 430 when our chief petty officer came to me and about five other petty officers and told us to go to the back of the hospital. I'm talking about the loading ramps where they used to bring in supplies. He told all of us that we were going to be there and we were going to bring the president's casket into the mortuary. We were told not to leave our posts. The chief said we got all the ghouls and reporters and the TV and everybody at the front of the hospital he said there would be an empty casket in the ambulance. He said that the president's body would really come in the back. And we took, we took the casket out and pushed it down a long illuminated hallway. Now, this is a service area, not the main part of the hospital. <clears throat> now, the, uh, Jerry Morlock, who was a reporter for the Grand Rapids newspaper, did his due diligence and was able to find two other men that corroborated Reverend Tisha's story, a man by the name of Richard Muma, and uh, another man by the name of Paul Nagler. It was actually Nagler that told the reporter that uh, they had pushed uh, the casket down a long illuminated hallway. Why is that important? Well, first of all, um, he's saying 30 to 40 minutes before the bronze casket arrived, that would put it somewhere in the vicinity of, say, 6.30, 6.25. And the fact that they put it on a gurney and wheeled it in is also something uh, important in, the, in this story. Uh, the fact that this was a service area where they brought in supplies and not part of the uh, main part of the hospital um, all contradicts the account that Dennis David had been giving for a number of years, and and perhaps we should take a a moment now to compare the two. Uh, Dennis David's story was that at uh, 5.30, he was in Captain Boswell, who was one of the autopsy doctors that night at the end of the day, uh, 
in Boswell's office when they heard that the uh, president was going to be brought to Bethesda. And then uh, I'd say about uh, a half hour later, uh, he goes to um, uh, the office. Uh, uh, I can't remember offhand who his uh, who that superior was, um, but um, nevertheless, uh, this five or six Secret Service agents there, and they're basically informing Dennis David, you know, what's going to transpire. Then at uh, at six, I maybe I'm sorry, six o'clock. He's contact Dennis Davis contacted that uh, your visitor is on the way and you need to assemble some men to offload. So by uh, 630, 640, the men are at the loading dock. And then at 645, that's when the uh, black hearse backs up to the uh, to what Dennis David describes as a wooden jetty. And the, the men that were in this uh, this hearse remove the casket from the back, slide it onto the wooden jetty, which was only about, as Dennis would say, 40, in, 40 inches off the ground. It was slid onto the jetty, and then Dennis David's men picked it up, walked through the double doors that led into the hospital from, from this loading dock, loading jetty, if you may, and then through those doors, only about seven or eight feet on the left, was an ante room. but then they walked the casket in there, and put it on the ground and left. So not only do we have a physical difference between the areas in which the caskets received, there's a time difference. Um, you know, one has uh, double doors uh, leading to that hallway where the men, uh, you know, just picked up the casket and walked it through, with the other one where Reventesh is, uh, has a ramp that the casket, which had been put on a gurney, is wheeled up to the, to the next level and then brought into the hospital and brought down a long illuminated hallway. Does that sound like the same area to you? No, in fact, it sort of sounds like it's a completely other area of the hospital. Well, uh, that's, that's what I uh, uh, began to, uh, to feel as well. And um, <clears throat> what I just read you, that, that story from the UPI, uh, I came across on the Internet. By that time, you know, so many things are popping up. Um, but I had not been familiar with the actual article itself. But I was familiar with Reverend Tesha's story to a degree because, like I said, I had interviewed him in, uh, say, 1996, 97. And a few of the highlights from that, and some of them don't even appear in this article that he shared with me, is first of all, the, uh, the black hearse, which actually came through a gate that led from the officers club and the, uh, and the uh, country club that was next door, uh, arrived with another car behind it, and both vehicles had their lights turned off. And then... Uh, and then when it arrived, they could, the, the loading dock area, concrete loading dock area, uh, was too high for them to back up and do the same thing that we, we you know, just heard that happened with Dennis Dave and his men. So they had to turn it around, and then they removed the casket, uh, which was also a, a great shipping casket, put on a gurney, and wheeled it inside. Um, the most extraordinary thing that he said to me that he just couldn't get over is the fact that... Um, even though around 4.30 or 5 o'clock, he was told to, uh, to go to the office, uh, the duty station, if you may, where his chief petty officer uh, told him what was going to happen. But his petty officer also told him and introduced him to a young army captain who from the rest of the evening, Reverend Tesh would be taking orders from. And this is, this is unheard of, unprecedented of uh, an army captain giving orders to Navy men in a naval setting. It was the first and only time that it ever happened uh, to Rebentesh in, in any event, and certainly was unusual uh, at that point in time. So um, putting those elements into uh, the story as well uh, creates a situation that's totally different from what uh, Dennis David had uh, told uh, people uh, at various times over the years. Well, what I find interesting 
is that these two stories of these two locations, the entrances, the exits, um, these two stories exist almost in isolation from one another for for decades until these particulars meet in Chicago one year. And I had William Matson Law on a show a few years back in, um, and he told me because because he was one of those who helped organize the conference. And he he told an interesting story about there being a lot of contention among those involved because they were all telling their stories, and and these are stories that they knew to be true, but they're all telling these stories that are unlike anyone else's story there. So they're all thinking, wait, is he lying? Yeah, am I just not remembering the story correctly? What what exactly is going on here? Well. What they began to learn over the conference, I guess it was a conference, it's kind of more of a meeting, I guess. What they began to learn was that both stories were true. And then those are the stories of the entrances and exits that you're telling tonight. I'm glad you brought that uh, that um, gathering up. It was put together by Phil Singer and William Law, I believe, in the uh, early part of uh, 2015. And what Phil Singer did was the very thing that I did in 1992 with these Bethesda men is he brought together for the first time, uh, the majority of the surviving men on the honor guard that were there at Bethesda that night to receive the bronze casket and, and bring it into the hospital. And, and so, uh, while they're all there telling their various experience, Dennis David was one of the people who was also there uh, invited by William and, and, and Phil Singer. And he told his story, as we just mentioned, you know, 40 inch high wooden jetty loading dock, his men picked up the casket and brought it in and set it on the floor of the, uh, of the ante room. Uh, and that's important. They don't bring it all the way in to the morgue, which is just a few feet further. They, they, for whatever reason, leave it on the floor of the ante room. But nevertheless, this is the first time these men like you, Clark are hearing about another casket and, and, uh, and they're incredulous because as far as they knew, they brought the president's body in at eight o'clock. So they have no idea about something that took place earlier. And as it turns out in another part of the hospital. So, um, that was, uh, that was obviously something that came to light during uh, during that particular uh, gathering uh, in Illinois at that time. But uh, you know, once I once I started to to digest the account, the newspaper re- account of what Rebentesh had said back in um, in eighty one, and then I went over my interview with him, uh, you know, from ninety six. When I did that interview with him personally, I just kind of did it once again, like I did with in 92 with the other Bethesda men, just kind of for posterity to, to document his story. I wasn't doing really any Q and a, cause I wasn't knowledgeable enough to know what questions to ask Kevin does in the first place. It was basically just an opportunity for him to tell his story as best as he could recall and, and document it. You know what I mean? So that, that's why, you know, I went back over it again and, and saw these other, uh, you know, things that didn't even appear in the, in the newspaper article. So now from 2015 to 2017, we're talking a couple of years now, and I even kind of enlisted the help of Dennis David and Jim Jenkins. We're trying to figure out where in God's name could this other area be that Rebentesh is talking about, this receiving area where supplies are brought into uh, a second loading dock, if you may. And we for the life of us could not come up with, with any answer to that whatsoever. And then, well, by pure accident, I come across what was a phone interview by uh, a terrific researcher by the name of uh, Kathy Cunningham on April 2nd, 1996 with Dr. Robert Carney. Now, Dr. Carney was a pathologist on staff there but he wasn't given the job of autopsying the president. That was given to Hume's Boswell and then Fink joined the party. Uh, so Carr and I that night was given the job of basically setting security around the morgue and in the hospital because newsmen were, were, you know, trying to get to, you know, take photographs or whatever to where, you know, this was taking place, uh, the autopsy. So uh, during the course of her interview with Dr. Carney. She asked a very innocuous question. 
I, and I've never spoken to her, so I've never had the opportunity to ask her why she asked him this, but she said, uh, where was the barbershop located? And Carr and I responded, quote, there was a new morgue in the new wing, building eight at that time. The barbershop was actually across from the old morgue. And that's where they brought the supplies into once they built the new morgue. That's where the Navy's exchange was too. It was on the lower level off the main building. It was a separate building. And the light switch goes on. I say to myself, oh my God, he's talking about not only the existence of, a new, of an old morgue, but that it's right down the hallway from a service area where they were bringing supplies into, which is exactly the, what was described by Donald Rebentesh. So we now seem to have an answer for where these two things were. Now, uh, this is a very early going now to even establish the existence of, all right, how do we corroborate this whole story of an old morgue, first of all? But then we also have to look at, first of all, the story of the new morgue. Um, they had a $5.6 million uh, expansion that started in 1960 that was finished in, in, in summer of 1963, and that was building seven and eight. These were new wings in the very back of, of the hospital. And in building eight in the basement, they had actually built a new morgue. And this is the morgue that Paul Connor and uh, Jim Jenkins started working in at, at the end of the summer of, uh, of, of 63. And that, um, and that uh, we were under the impression that, that that's where the president's body was also brought for autopsy. So um, that explains that morgue and that situation. But no one other than Dr. Carney has ever mentioned to my, I, I've never seen another witness, anybody, author, investigator, HSCA, you name it, um, ever mentioned, well, actually, I shouldn't say that to ST because the HSCA in one sentence actually also mentioned those two words. And it also came from Carney, where he said that he was setting security because new newsmen were running from the old morgue to the new morgue. And they were trying to make sure that they didn't get, you know, in, but why, why would there be newsmen running from one or the other? if there was only one morgue at that present time, a new morgue in Building A, you know? Well, because Bethesda is a naval hospital, there should be some sort of a history of architectural designs, architectural plans that should tell us this answer. Do we not have those? William Law, William Law actually went with Jim Jenkins. Hopefully I'm not talking out of, uh, you know, uh, but, but they actually, after I brought a lot of this to their attention, uh, and they wanted to look into it further and they went to Bethesda and met with people and they were showing deference to, uh, Jim Jenkins at the time because they knew his history of being there for the autopsy of the president at that time, so forth and so on, but they would not relinquish a map or a drawing or anything of, of, of the uh, layout of the hospital at that time. And they still won't. <sighs> That's very frustrating, especially because it's a naval hospital. It should be public record, but we know um, some things that should be public record are not. So the nearest thing we may have to a drawing, a sketch, might be the Rydberg drawing. What is the Rydberg drawing and why is it important? Okay, well... Um, that that's that's the next thing that that um, I looked at that would help us try to understand the reality, if you may, that there were actually two morgues in the hospital that it, that was present at that time. Obviously, the old morgue was supposedly no longer in use because they had a new morgue in Building Eight in the basement. But uh, when William Law was writing his book, the very first uh, edition. He had interviewed Skip Rydberg. He's the man who did the drawings of, of the president's wound for the Warren Commission, even though he never saw photographs of the body or anything that were described to him by Humes and Boswell. But um, he was an actual medical illustrator that had been at Bethesda Hospital from, I believe, early 1962 on for, for a few years. And so after William had interviewed um, Mr. Rydberg, he asked him if if he was familiar with the morgue and could do a drawing for him. 
and and Rydberg did, uh, and William was very excited about it. But he decided to show the drawing to Jim Jenkins and Paul O'Connor, who in fact had been in that room that night. Rydberg had not been, obviously, um, you know, and showed the drawing. Uh, and and both men, O'Connor and Jenkins, says, "Well, that's not right. It, it's wrong. It, you know, the cabinets are in the wrong place." It doesn't show uh, the enclave that we had in the back or a dressing room and, 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 and all these other things. Uh, but the most important thing that appeared in Rydberg's drawing was the fact that the cold boxes that existed at the new morgue in the ante room that was connected with the morgue were actually in this drawing inside the room. And so that's a major contradiction between uh, the new morgue with an ante room and the coal boxes in there and the drawing of, of a morgue that has the coal boxes inside the room. So because of that, William never published the, the drawing by Rydberg in his book. But now that we have this new information, you know, uh, at that time that we're looking at, it, it made sense to reevaluate what the drawings actually telling us. And what William and I believe is the fact that Rydberg had been in the old morgue in 62 or, or, you know, part of 63 to the point where, you know, when he went to do the drawing, that was what he remembered and envisioned, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, that gave us one more piece of the puzzle, uh, if you may. So before we move on to the next part of the story, is there any other substantiation about the old morgue? Well, uh, I ended up personally reaching Dr. Carney uh, in uh, February of 2022. And the reason uh, for contacting and speaking with him, and he was very kind to, uh, to talk with me, was the fact that I wanted to get more of an understanding of where the old morgue was, uh, what differentiated that from the new morgue that he had talked about years before to Kathy Cunningham and, 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 and really kind of nailed down the fact that, you know, these two morgues actually existed, you know, at the same time, if you may, even if only one of them by November of 63 was actually supposedly, you know, functionally in, in use, so to speak, officially, like I said. And so uh, he told me that, in fact, uh, the old morgue was in the lower level of Building 2, right off the annex. Now, um, I was able to find an overhead. I don't know what year it, it pertained to the hospital, but an overhead that basically gave this whole layout, uh, showed you where Building 2 was, which connected with the main building, where the towers were, Building 1. Uh, it then showed the new wing in the very back of the hospital, uh, building nine, where that was located. And then off to the side, there was a building four. And that's where I believe that service area was located, which had a ramp right connected to it, uh, where they brought the supplies in and where Revintesh and his party um, brought the casket in at, at around uh, 630 or so um, the other thing that Dr. Khan I confirmed for me is the fact that the old morgue did not have an ante room where cold boxes were located. The old morgue had their cold boxes inside the room. So Khan I, who personally had done autopsies there before there was a the creation of a new morgue, you know, uh, substantiates what we're seeing in the Rydberg drawing, which is cold boxes in inside the uh, the room, which was the old morgue. So. That, that was very important. Um, but now we have to ask ourselves the real question here, which is, uh, let, let's look at a new timeline. We, we have, according to Rebintesh, a body uh, that they're receiving, say, even if it's not 40 minutes, say 30 minutes before Jackie Kennedy arrives in front of the hospital, that would say place it around 635 uh, and then this, this casket is brought into the hospital. Um, the beauty of the AARB uh, work and the materials that we can now, anybody listening to this can go online and, for instance, uh, Google uh, Ed Reed AARB interview. And, and these are the p puzzle pieces now that we have available to us, ST, that we can assemble to now get a sense 
now that we we have the actual reality, if you may, of not one morgue, but two morgues. And uh, Reed was asked the question by the ARB, did you ever see the casket with Pre- President Kennedy's body in it? And he says, yes, I did. And they ask him, when did you first see that? And he says, when I returned from the chow hall, the dining room to the ground floor morgue, the main hallway leading into the morgue, and, and did you see the casket in the hallway? Yes, I did. Or in the morgue? He said, it was sitting, lying on the ground, and then the guy asking the question says, right. And, 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 and uh, Reed says, and there were five or six Marine corpsmen at attention lined up across the hallway. What did you observe next? Then he talks about the fact that they picked up the casket from the hallway and carried it into the morgue. Now, what's important about this statement is the fact that he's talking about uh, five or six Marines at attention right across from where this casket is, is sitting on, on, the, in the, on the floor in a hallway. Now, we're not talking about the ante room, uh, the new morgue. We're talking about a hallway uh, just in, that leads into, into the morgue. Now, the Roger Boysian story of his Marines, co- to me, coincides exactly with this casket entrance. Now, <clears throat> what's going on here is the fact that someone has pulled some kind of deception um, you know, as far as actually bringing the president's body into the hospital at that time that's logged in by the Marines and Roger Boyge in his report that, that's brought in at 735 for a pre-examination of the body. And this is, and then right after that happens, the casket's brought in. I believe within 10 to 15 minutes, the casket is then brought around to the back of the building, and at 6:45 is is what is received by Dennis David. Now, the one thing I can never understand was why would they put the body of the president that's in the shipping casket on the floor of an ante room, not even bring it into the morgue? leave it there and, and, and walk away unless it's, it's empty. Perhaps that's the situation. The body's not in there yet. And, uh, moreover, one, one of the things that, that, that drove lift into his hypothesis is the fact that he had the witness of Dennis David receiving the casket at, at 645. And then he has a witness, Paul Connor, who's in, in the autopsy room, and he receives the casket later on. Now, I think Mr. Lifton would have us believe that the casket made an unre- uninterrupted stop from his men bringing it in uh, from the loading dock area right into the morgue, which is then witnessed by Paul Connor. And then that's when things begin to happen in that autopsy room. The problem is. Dennis David's men dropped the casket off on the floor of the ante room at 645. Officially, Paul Connor didn't log the casket coming through the doors of the morgue until eight o'clock. And he remembers that vividly. In fact, he even remembered the, the number that he put in the logbook, A63272. So with that kind of memory, you know, I find it difficult to question uh, the time that Paul Connor is giving us of the casket actually coming into the morgue. But that gives us a, a, a situation where from 645 to 8 p.m., you have a casket that's sitting on the floor of the ante room. What's going on with that? And, and there's no answer for what happened in that hour and 15 minutes or so. All we know is that 645 is when it's dropped on the floor. And eight o'clock is when it comes through the doors of the morgue. So, you know, these kind of things have been debated over the years, uh, you know, and everybody's been trying to figure out where the puzzle pieces fall in and make the square peg fit into the round hall, round hole. But if we take into consideration now for the first time that there's actually a second morgue, if you may, where the, the body has actually been brought to at 635 and begins say for an hour or more, uh, a pre-examination, photographic documentation, and removal of any evidence that would show the bullet tracks into the, into the body, i.e. the brain, 
uh, the throat wound being expanded, so forth and so on. All this is taking place before the body ever reaches Paul Connor at 8 p.m. Now, um, one of the things that's important, again, that nobody has ever been able to figure out where it falls into the puzzle, if you may, are the stories of Robert Knudsen and William Pitzer. Now, both men uh, were in possession of photographic materials pertaining to uh, the autopsy. And yet, uh, and, and nobody really uh, felt that these men were lying or that they should be discarded and disregarded, but, but nobody knew what to do with them because there are no witnesses at the autopsy that Paul Connor, Jim Jenkins, et cetera, were at after eight o'clock. There's no witness to the presence of Pitzer or Knutson being there. So nobody could figure out, you know, where do their stories you know, fit into this whole equation. And this is where they do, in my opinion, that as soon as this body is brought into the old morgue around 635, then Mr. Knudsen takes photographs and, and Mr. Pitzer is taking film and they're documenting the wounds on the president as they have appeared to the doctors in Dallas. And before they've been altered and changed, and then appeared later on the evening to Paul Connor, Jenkins, Humes, Boswell, etc. So um, that, I believe, is when that took place. Well, what we're starting to see here is that is that there's a lot going on in in the handling of the body at this moment, and and maybe this was planned beforehand, maybe it was all sort of sort of haphazardly being organized on the fly. But the idea of multiple entrances and multiple morgues and multiple caskets and maybe even multiple bodies, I think we're going to touch on that more later. Uh, we're starting to get a picture of alteration and manipulation, and then the formation of what would be the cover story, at least from the perspective of the autopsy. Well, well I, I think what we have is maybe alteration is the wrong word to use. I think the point of this pre-examination and all this clandestine uh, things going on is the fact that rather than de- as a devious method, as David Lifton unfortunately believed, is that they were altering the wounds in order to confuse the doctors and the, and the photographic cameras as to the true nature uh, of the wound in the back of the head and so forth and so on. I, in essence, think it's not alteration. It's, it's uh, basically examination and removal of evidence. That was the whole point and agenda of, of bringing the body into the southern part of the hospital uh, where it's not logged in, it's not official, it's done basically in secrecy in order to see where the wounds were. See, Because at that point, Esty, we have to believe that they knew that they were already dealing with a man who's been arrested, who they need to be firing shots from behind. And so uh, anything that would track with a shot from the front uh, is causing them problems as far as the fluid situation that they were dealing with at, the, at that time. But um, the, the beauty, like I said, of the ARB and, you know, and then not only that, the ARB releasing interviews done by the HSCA, which was supposedly sealed for, I don't know, but correct me if I'm wrong, whether it was 50 years or 75 years, we were never supposed to know or read the, the, the accounts of the uh, interviews or testimony of people like Robert Knudsen and, and somebody I'm going to mention in a little while, Richard Lipsy and, and, and even Paul Connor and Jim Jenkins, their interviews and so forth and so on. Those are supposed to be buried, um, you know, for people uh, to be unable to read for, for many, many years. But um, the A- one more important thing, if you, if you don't mind, from the AARB interview with, with Ed Reed, it's the fact that at the very end, he starts telling them about Dr. Humes performing uh, an incision in the forehead of the body and, re- and bring, pulling back the scalp. And then they're asking him about that. And, and, uh, and they ask uh, with a scalpel and uh, he says it's being done with a scalpel. And then they ask him and pulling the scalp back and Reed says, that's correct. And then they ask him, and were you able to see the size of the wound from, from when the scalp, and then before he, you know, the question's finished, he says, not from where I was, no. The podium was a good 20 feet away. What else did you observe from where you were 
in regard to any incisions or operations on the head. And this is the kicker uh, from Reed. Well, after about 20 minutes, Commander Humes took out a saw and started to cut the forehead with the bone with the saw, mechanical saw, circular, small, mechanical, uh, almost like a cast saw, but it, but it was made specifically for bone. And then they asked, well, what did you see next? And he said, well, we were then asked to leave at that time. Jerry Custer and myself were asked to leave. And then, and then uh, Reed's asked, do you know why you were asked to leave? And he says, well, because we were no more assistance. Our assistance was not needed. X-rays were done. And someone decided that we weren't needed. And they asked us to leave. Did you see the brain removed? No. Did you go back into the morgue at any time that evening? No, I did not. Did you see any incisions on the chest at all? None. Did you ever see President Kennedy's body again? No, I did not. Now, so what we're gathering from Ed Reed's uh, interview or testimony with the ARB that he and Jerry Custer were there in the very early going from 6.35 to when the body had to have been removed and then brought around to the back of the hospital a little before eight o'clock. And then that was it for them for the rest of the evening. So Custer and Reed as x-ray technicians were never involved with the autopsy that took place after eight o'clock involving Paul Connor, Jim Jenkins and, and so forth and so on. So, um, you know, that, that's just one example of, uh, uh, of, of setting apart these two episodes, if you may. The other part of this pre-examination that's, that's so important to understand is the, um, is the stories of Joe O'Donnell and of Dennis David that were, uh, that were taken in uh, uh, Joe O'Donnell on January 29th, 1997 by uh, Doug Horn. And then uh, just a week later, Dennis David is called by Doug Horn and he gives his story uh, to him. Uh, and, and if I could just read you, um, and this is pertaining to Knudsen uh, and, and then to uh, Pitzer. For Joe O'Donnell, he was a close friend of, of Robert Knudsen's and was another White House photographer. And uh, uh, a day or so after the assassination, uh, he tells the story to the ARB, quote, that he was shown approximately 12 five by seven inch black and white photos. The views included the president lying on his back, on his stomach, and close ups of the back of the head, about two inches above the hairline. There was about the size of a grapefruit, a hole that clearly penetrated the skull and was very deep. Another one of the photographs showed a hole in the forehead above the right eye, which is a round wound about three eighths of an inch in diameter, which he interpreted as a gunshot wound. So we have photographic materials in the hands of Robert Knudsen that's seen by his friend a few days later at the White House, describing a large exit wound in the back of the head and an entrance wound in the forehead above the right eye. Now, the one interesting thing about Knudsen's interview with the HSCA, and now that it's available online, I, I recommend to everybody uh, to go and read that because uh, I think they found Knudsen after he had retired, about a year after he retired, he gave an interview to a, a popular magazine uh, for photography, and then it was probably actually called Popular Photography, stated that the hardest thing he ever had to do in his time as a White House photographer was to photograph the autopsy of President Kennedy. So however they found him, uh, Andy Purdy uh, ends up interviewing Knudsen, uh, and he is very reluctant to share any details about what he saw. Now, they didn't ask him, did you take the photographs? And he didn't volunteer that he had. He did share the fact that early the, the next morning, uh, he was given uh, the film by Admiral Berkeley, color film, rolls of, of color film to, to go and develop, which he did, uh, came back to the White House with that, and then was sent back to the lab to develop individual photographs from this material. But uh, they were asking Knudsen about metal probes in the body. 
And he's saying to him, to, to HSEA that I'm not saying I didn't see these probes. I'm saying I can't discuss them. And he had been put under a secret seal by the Secret Service and by another man who he happened to work under at the White House because he was a Navy photographer by the name of Captain Taswell Shepard. And not only was Shepard the one that received a, a set of the photographs that Knudsen ended up developing and bringing to the White House, he was also the one that, that told uh, Knudsen that he was under secrecy oath, did not even discuss anything that appeared in the photographs or his involvement with them. So later on in the HSCA interview, they finally convinced Knudsen, they've talked to somebody in the Justice Department or whoever it was, that they finally convinced Knudsen, you can talk about what you saw. Now, uh, the way he describes uh, the probes in the body lead me b to believe that he had to have witnessed this personally and not just something that he saw in a photograph from film that he was asked to develop. And the important thing that he talks about in this whole thing, he does mention a large uh, wound in the back of the head, but the important thing regarding probes is that he says that a, a probe was put through the front of the neck of the president's body it came out the back of the neck. So we're talking about a through and through probe that they put into what they considered at that time to be the entrance wound going out the back of the neck. Why is that important? Other than the fact to show that there was a shot that struck the, Ken the president in the neck from the front is the fact that when it came to the official formal autopsy after eight o'clock, Humes and Boswell were told not by Berkeley not to touch the wound in the throat. Why would he say that is because I think that an hour and a half or more earlier, they had already examined the body and were able to determine definitively that there was a shot from the front that went through the throat and out the back. And they did not want that dealt with or dissected or anything at the official autopsy later on that evening. They were just able to get away with the fact that that wound in the throat was in fact, uh, had to have been, uh, you know, the tracheotomy that took place uh, at Parkland. When they knew full well that there was in fact a shot that struck him in the throat because they probed it an hour and a half earlier. Now, w the O'Donnell story complements perfectly with Dennis David's story. Now, Dennis David, the Tuesday right after the Friday assassination, goes to see a good friend of his, uh, um, William Pitzer, who's head of audiovisual uh, department at uh, Bethesda and plays cards every week with, with Dennis. And he just went to visit him and, and he walks in the office and he sees that uh, Pitzer is working on film and making, actually making 35 millimeter slides from 16 millimeter film. He never asked Pitzer, did you take the film? He just automatically assumed that he did because he was head of audiovisual. But in interviewing, uh, interviewing uh, Dennis David, you know, as told by Doug Horn on uh, February 6, 1997, Dennis says, quote, uh, in, in, as far as picture, he said the motion picture film, although somewhat grainy, clearly showed a gaping wound in the back of the president's head and that the top of the head looked intact. David was quite certain that there was no evidence of any Y incision in the photographs viewed. When asked to specify to the best of his ability where the entrance wound was located, he estimated it was about three inches forward of the right ear and just below the hairline near the top of the forehead. So we have two men in two different situations looking at photographic material taken by two different people that describe an entrance wound in the forehead and a large exit wound in the back of the head. This leads me to believe that we now know where Knudsen and Pitzer were in the earlier part of the evening. They were at the old morgue for pre-examination, documenting the wounds as they appeared at, uh, at Parkland in Dallas uh, and documenting them on film before anything was actually done to remove physical evidence from the body. One more other very important witness that comes into play here 
this and during this evening. And again, uh, I, I recommend to anybody to go online and find the, uh, the testimony interview, if you may, by the HSCA with Richard Lipsy. And Richard Lipsy was the aide to General Wheel, who was involved with organizing all the, uh, the events of that weekend, so to speak, uh, pertaining to the uh, funeral and so forth and so on. And he was told by the general to stay with the president's body. And he arrived along with Wheel and the, uh, the honor guard men, you, you Clark, James Felder, et cetera, from uh, Andrews in a helicopter to Bethesda. And, uh, and you're, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the story of the, of the uh, honor guard, but uh, they arrived about 15 minutes before the Great Navy Ambulance, where Jackie Kennedy did. And they were told they were put into a pickup truck that drove them right there to the front of the hospital. And they were told to stand to the side uh, uh, of the stairway there. And, uh, and then once Jackie Kennedy entered the hospital, they were then to move to the, uh, to the ambulance with, I think at that moment in time was the understanding that they would remove the, 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 the casket, uh, in the ambulance, uh, remove it and bring it up the stairs into the front entrance uh, of Bethesda. But, uh, after the ambulance arrives, Jackie gets out and goes inside as they go to move toward the ambulance, uh, a crowd of photographers and other people start to swarm it to the point where then somebody gets in and just drives it away, leaving them just stand, leaving the honor guard, just standing there. Now, before I, we get into the, the whole chase with the honor guard going after the Great Navy ambulance, um, the one question that came to my mind about hearing this story from you Clark about all these photographers is the fact that one image has ever surfaced from anybody of that moment in time in front of the hospital with the ambulance. Not one. I don't know what kind of power it takes to repress that kind of material or, or, or information. Uh, but they, uh, but they ended up doing that. And the other, the other story that's interesting, uh, about the ambulance and the, and the driver is the fact that after Dennis David, uh, had his men leave the, the shipping casket on the, uh, on the floor of the ante room. And then they were sent back to their quarters. He went to the front of the hospital to just check on offices, security, that kind of thing. And he happened to be at the very front, uh, of the hospital on the, on the upper level there, where he was able to look through the big, uh, picture windows, uh, at the front of, uh, Bethesda and see the, uh, the Navy ambulance arrive with Jackie Kennedy. And who does he see get out of the driver's seat? But um, Admiral Galloway, who's the uh, it was the superior officer of, of Bethesda Complex. But we got a problem because the Navy ambulance was driven away from Air Force One and Andrews by Bill Greer. Now, how 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 can this possibly be? Unless and there was talk about decoy you know Navy ambulances, uh, then you know. I don't have an answer for it, but I can just tell you from what Dennis David uh, witnessed. Now we can say that, well, Dennis could have been confused or he misremembered that kind of thing. But in the very next day, November 23rd in the Washington post, one of the reporters stated that he was in the front of the hospital when he saw Admiral Galloway get back into the ambulance and drive it away. Now, Bill Greer secret service agent is supposed to be the one at all times during this whole situation driving the ambulance. So where does Galway come into play and which Navy ambulance is this, you know, but nevertheless, the honor guard get into a truck. They chase this ambulance around for what seems to be almost 40 or 45 minutes, if you can believe it. And then finally they get to the part of the hospital where they see the ambulance. There's no driver in it, nobody in the ambulance. It's just General Godfrey McHugh, who happened to also at Andrews Air Force Base, try to inject himself into the men from the honor guard, unloading the casket in, into the Navy ambulance. And he tried to push one of the men aside and, and pick up the casket himself. So here he is again, and he's with this ambulance that just has a casket in it. And there's no Secret Service men in sight. Nobody. It's just McHugh the ambulance and the casket. And, 
and and so I thought, well, maybe you, Clark, when he told me this, is is, is getting his facts wrong, or maybe he read something and that's what was stated. But when I talked to years later, I talked to James Felder as well, and he told me the exact same thing: no Secret Service men, and that they, you know, was just a, a an ambulance with a casket. What's important about the honor guard at this point is we're now at eight o'clock. Okay. At 8 PM in building eight, Paul Connors logged in uh, the gray shipping casket. We're now at eight o'clock at the part of the hospital where Donald Rebentesh had unloaded his, his gray shipping casket at 6:35 in the evening. And that same loading area with that same ramp that led up to the, to the level where then you would walk through a door and, and then, you know, go down the hallway. That is where the honor guard is now bringing the bronze Dallas casket. They don't even know about building uh, eight, the new morgue. They think that they're bringing this casket into the morgue where the president's body is going to be uh, autopsy. And uh, so now we have a real crazy situation on our hands, and uh, and that and that's where uh, and that's where Lipsy comes in. Now uh, he talked; to, he was inside the hospital, and he described to the HSCA, um, "quote When you walked in the autopsy room from the back door, where they brought the body in, you turned left down a very short hallway." had the doors right there. When you walked in, there was sort of like a little spectator's gallery on the right there, several chairs on the right with a railing on, with a railing in front. The table was in front of that. I would say maybe from, from the doctors I was watching from approximately 12 to 15 feet away. Now, not only is he describing the short hallway that led into the old morgue. I'm not talking about an anteroom here. But the most important thing he says at this juncture of his interview is the fact that the little spectator's gallery right there on the right with several chairs. The gallery in the, in the new morgue ST was bleachers. Like you would go to a high school football game? Not chairs. I spoke to Captain, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, I remember Sergeant James Felder. He, he and Samuel Byrd, Lieutenant Byrd, who was involved with the whole, you know, bringing the casket and so forth. He and Byrd stayed in the autopsy room. The other men were, were left in the hallway to provide security. And Felder described the exact same podium, the gallery with chairs. In fact, he called it like theater seating. And so that, to me, definitively shows that the honor guard and the body that they brought in the bronze casket was now after eight o'clock at night in the old morgue. So the, the old morgue was getting a lot of action that day. Not only did it deal with the pre-examination of the president's body, but then a, a time later, the bronze casket with the body of someone else is brought into the old morgue. Now we have to ask ourselves this question, whose body is it? And why is it being autopsied in, in this other morgue at that point in time? Well, that this brings us back, in my estimation, again, I'm speculating, to the story of the dead Secret Service agent. Now, we thought initially that uh, it was just a story that was in, incorrectly put out into the media and then was retracted later on. But do you remember Mark Crouch that I told you about earlier and, and the story? Well, Mark also was a, had amazing serendipity in his life. And, and he happened to, to meet and, and, and get to know this man, Secret Service uh, Agent James Fox, who not only ended up having uh, these photographs that we, we know now exist as, as quote unquote, the authentic uh, autopsy photographs of the president that he showed and shared with Mark Crouch. But, you know, a few months before Fox passed away, he shared another story. And that was is that that late afternoon, he was in the offices of the Protective Research Services uh, as uh, Secret Service agent uh, Robert Bauk. And Bauk told him that they had to collect some men and they were going to retrieve the body 
of a secret ser- a dead secret service agent. And Fox told uh, Mark Crouch, this was one of ours, and I'm not referring to the president. So we have Fox saying that they physically actually received the body of what they were told was a dead secret service agent. Now, it's a leap of faith to think that perhaps this is the body that's brought in uh, via the bronze casket into the old morgue after eight o'clock with the reason being that they needed a body to, and this is again, a fluid situation that's going on. This wasn't something that was uh, organized or planned months ahead of time. This is on the fly, but they needed a body that they could replicate or create wounds pertaining to shots fired from behind. And that that was the purpose of this body to serve that. The one problem they had with this is that Lipsy in his account to the HSCA and he, he drew a diagram is he actually has three wounds on the body from behind in his drawing that he said he personally witnessed one at the very, uh, below the neck and the top of the back, um, that didn't go anywhere. They couldn't find it. And then right around the EOP, uh, a few inches above the hairline was, uh, a wound from the back that went out the front of the throat, according to Lipsy. And then the third wound was a, was a wound that just struck the right top of the head and exploded that area. So there was no real entrance or ent- entrance or exit wound. It was just a, a large blow up and the right top of the head that he says actually entered part of the face, which again is never witnessed or seen by anybody in the, in the O'Connor Jenkins autopsy. But Mr. Felder sitting in the gallery with Sam Bird watching what's going on, sees the same wound, the right top of the head into the face. So in essence, he's not only uh, accounting for a gallery that Lipsy has described that they were sitting in, but he's also talking about a head wound uh, that Lipsy described that Felder himself saw as well, which again, in my mind, establishes you know, the two body situation here. Uh, but now it gets into the real twilight zone. And I'm not going to speculate as to what this means. I'm just going to tell you the facts as they have been documented. And, and then people could come to their own conclusion. So we have a body autopsied and, and then, um, and then morticians working on it uh, in both the old morgue and the new morgue. And then new caskets, you know, are brought in uh, in which to put the body in to bring to the White House and for the president to be buried in after the fact. Now, the honor guard in bringing the casket out of the morgue they were at, luckily the, the casket was on a gurney or a church truck. So all they had to do was wheel it down the hallway, down the ramp, and then to the back of, of the ambulance. But in doing so, when they finally lift this casket, they realized the thing is weighs well, one estimation went from 700 pounds to 1,000 pounds, depending on which man you talk to. But nevertheless, they realized immediately they need, they're six men. They now need to add two more for the rest of the weekend to be dealing with this cas- carrying this casket, in which they added two more men to the, to the uh, honor guard, the ceremonial guard. So you got them removing a casket from Bethesda uh, that weighs anywhere from 700 to 1,000 pounds. Now in Gaulers, and they're the ones that are doing the, the work on the president's body after the autopsy in O'Connor, Jenkins, Humes, and Boswell's uh, uh, new morgue, uh, they do an, a, a written report after the fact where they state that when it came time to put the president's body in the casket and remove it from the hospital to, to put it into the Navy ambulance, that Roy Kellerman, the Secret Service agent, insisted that his Secret Service agents be the ones to remove the casket from the hospital and put it into the ambulance. So we have an honor guard bringing a casket out to an ambulance, and then we have Secret Service men bringing a casket out to an ambulance. But to top it, 
the, the, the real kicker of this whole thing is in the formal information that came with Gawler's report, the casket that he says the Kennedy family uh, purchased was a Marcellus 710 mahogany casket weighing 255 pounds. Hmm. Yeah, that's not a thousand pounds. So we have, no, no, it isn't. So now we have, if we're taking all of this at face value and that somebody isn't making up a story here, we have two groups of men re removing two caskets at two very distinct different ways, you know, weights. Now, now we have the situation where at least the honor guards casket seems to be making its way to the white house and is brought to the East room where then a decision has to be made and the casket is opened up and Jackie Kennedy looks in and, and they're at the point where they're trying to make a decision. Should we have an open casket for people to walk by and view the present? And she looks in and she, and she's just states, he looks so waxen. And this was overheard personally by J James Felder standing right next to the casket at attention. And then they bring over a family friend, William Walton, to get his opinion on whether or not they should have a, an open casket. And he states, quote, it has no resemblance to the president. It's a wax dummy. Now, Take this for what it's worth, and I have no answer as to the meaning of all this. I'm just telling you the facts as they've been stated. But uh, there's, there seems to be so much more going on in this that we just don't even have uh, answers for. But uh, getting back to the old morgue and the autopsy being done on the body there, uh, we seem to also, thanks to the uh, HSCA, uh, have more corroboration. They interviewed Captain David Osborne, who was chief of surgery at Bethesda at that time. And, um, and they got a, a statement from him being part of the actual autopsy. He was, he was uh, questioned by a researcher, Joanne Braun, uh, in April of 1990. And he wrote to her, quote, a bullet hit in the occipital region of the posterior skull, which blew off the posterior top of his skull and impacted and dis disintegrated against the inferior surface of the frontal bone, just above the level of the eyes. I know this for a fact because I was the one who worked on his head, removing his brain and closed the skull so he could have had an open casket funeral if desired. So what Osborne is telling this researcher in this letter is the fact that, once again, as described by Felder and by Lipsy, that there's a wound in the right front of the head uh, that did tremendous damage there. But moreover, he's saying that he's the one that removed the brain and then closed, put the skull cap back on. Well, when I talked to Dr. Carney and asked him about the statement by Osborne, and by the way, Osborne is listed both in the FBI uh, Seaburn O'Neill report and the HSCA as being present at the president's autopsy. But after, after asking uh, Carney about Osborne's statement, he laughed. He said, Ozzy, the FBI wouldn't have even let him into the autopsy room because obviously he wasn't part of the pathology team. But yet you got Osborne describing another event that he's personally involved in. So wh what this made me do is something I should have done years before ST and, and maybe others can do this now is I finally started to do due diligence and read the actual interviews with people uh, from the HSAA to, you know, people like Chester Boyers, people like uh, Jan Gale Rudnicki and, and people like obviously, uh, uh, Lipsy, uh, and 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 this now gives us a sense of the fact that there were these men were in fact at the other morgue, the old morgue, uh, working on a completely different body from the president. And uh, once you start to combine all these statements and try to get a grasp of them, you realize that there is in fact corroboration. It's just a strange situation where one hand completely didn't know what the other hand was doing that night, 
and there were two separate events happening at pretty much the same time. And, and the, the, and the, uh, and the honor guard thought they were dealing with, with the president's body. And, and Dennis David felt that, you know, in essence, you know, they were all fooled, you know? So, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's important to understand. Wow. And that is a lot. Um, I think it would be helpful to everyone out there if we, if we can do this, uh, if, sure. if we can take a moment and if you could tell us sort of a list of names of, uh, who was at each location? Who was at the old morgue? Who was at the new morgue? Okay. Well, I think if we start at the beginning, uh, we have at 635, Reverend Tesh and his group bringing a casket into the hospital, uh, which I believe uh, is delivered to what we now know, understand to be the old morgue. And, and this body... Um, is being examined by, I, I believe Humes and Boswell were actually part of that pre-examination. Berkeley could very well have also ha- probably had to have been there because, it, you know, at the end of the day, Knudsen said that he received film uh, from Berkeley to go and develop. Now we know from the historical record, so to speak, that all the photographs that were taken by Stringer and Reby ended up in the hands of the secret service man, Kellerman, who then gave them a few days later to Fox, James Fox, uh, who was the Secret Service uh, photographer, to go and develop. So uh, we, we definitely have separate situations there. And moreover, we have two men, Knuts and Pittsburgh, that are documenting the body. So all this is going on from, say, 6.35 to, say, a little bit before 8 o'clock, because there had to be time to then put the body uh, into a body bag, probably putting a white sheet over it, putting it on a gurney and wheeling it from that northern front part of the hospital to the very rear of the new wing building eight, where in the basement you have uh, the old morgue. And at that point, I believe it's put into the gray shipping casket that had been just sitting there for an hour and 15 minutes or so. And then that shipping casket is brought into Paul Connor's morgue uh, at eight o'clock. And, and then we have the situation while the O'Connor autopsy is taking place. Uh, we then have a situation where, uh, you know, the honor guard is bringing a bronze casket in and, and, and the honor guard's presence and the eight o'clock arrival that they bring in the casket is not even addressed by the government in the Warren commission investigation, the HSCA investigation. It's like they didn't exist. And, and the reason for that, ST, is the fact that in both those reports, the the uh, HSCA, especially in their final uh, medical report, state that the body came in at 7:35, as uh, according to Dr. James Humes. So, if that's officially the time that Humes says the body arrived at the morgue, then how do you deal with an eight o'clock arrival of a bronze casket by the uh, honor guard? The only way you deal with it is, is pretend it didn't even happen. So I just want to be perfectly clear about this point right now. At the point in the story where we are, we are not 100% sure or we do not have evidence of one particularly particular person who can be named who was aware of what was happening in both morgues. I mean, obviously there had to be someone or there had to be multiple someones, but um, at this point in our story, we are not aware of someone who knew exactly what was happening in each location at the exact time that it was happening. Well, uh, I'll t- that's a good, that's a very good question, and I've asked myself this, and I'll blame myself to a degree. Uh, but it, it always entered into my mind that the only person that has even mentioned the existence of two morgues at Bethesda, Dr. Robert Carr and I. I mean, you know, even the men like O'Connor and Jenkins that joined, uh, you know, at, at Bethesda late summer, they had no idea. Dennis David, no idea that there was actually, because, uh, you know, it should have made sense to them that if this is a brand new morgue in Building 8, a wing that just opened up in, in August of 63, that prior to that, there had to have been some other kind of morgue somewhere. But nobody was thinking of that at all. But to me, it, it occurred to me that maybe Dr. Carr and I actually knew that events were going on at both parts of the hospital. I never, when I talked to him, I spoke to him two or three times, 
never broached the subject because I didn't want to show, I, as, as bad as it sounds, I didn't want to show my hand and make it sound like some crazy theory because then he would not talk to me again. And, and I didn't want to lose that connection, so to speak. But um, the interesting thing for me is that Stephen O'Neill had a list of everybody they say stepped foot in the morgue that night. And they list people, they list people like um, Captain Osborne and Rudnicki and Boyers. But they say it's very superficial. You know, Boyers walked in at the very end to type up a memo for them. Um, you know, Rudnicki was there as an assistant to, uh, to Boswell. But the problem with Rudnicki is the fact that Jim Jenkins was there the whole day. Jim Jenkins knew Rudnicki personally because they worked some shifts together over a period of time. And he knew for a fact, personally, Rudnicki was not in the morgue. And years later, he called Rudnicki. And he, he, he asked him, you weren't in the morgue, were you? And then Rudnicki had to admit, yes, I, I wasn't. Because he knew that Jenkins was there and, and would know that. And he said, well, I was actually upstairs dealing with some slide samples or whatever. But uh, in actuality, if you read the HSCA report or interview with Rudnicki, he described, he actually describes the wounds as we were hearing them from Knutson and uh, Pitzer's materials uh, of where the exit wound was in the back of the head, so forth and so on. So I, th I feel that Rudnicki was actually helping Boswell and Humes out at the very beginning of the evening in the old morgue for the pre-examination. But um, Carnike, like I said, knowing he putting security, as it seemed, both parts of the morgue, uh, both, I'm sorry, both morgues at that, at that time. HSCA expanded their list of everybody that stepped foot into the morgue that night. The only person that's not listed by Siebert O'Neill and the HSCA of all of these people was Dr. Robert Carnine. And he stated when he's interviewed to the, by the HSCA and the ARB decided he was worthy of interviewing him as well. And he talks about walking in periodically, seeing the wounds on the president's head and this happening and that. He describes seeing photographer John Stringer, who photographed the president's body at the autopsy after eight o'clock, having to stand on a ladder to take pictures with the Sasselblad because he was so short, you know, uh, details like this, you know, Carney share, and yet Carney is not even mentioned as being anywhere near the morgue by the HSCA. Maybe they knew, maybe they knew that he actually had information that could be a problem at the end of the day. And I have to ask myself, how did the FBI include in their list of witnesses who were at President Kennedy's autopsy that I believe firmly were actually in the other end of the building in an autopsy that was somebody else's body, unless the FBI guys knew that the, these two events were going on. I have to ask myself that question. I think it should be asked, you know? Yes, right. I want to take you back to your introduction. Uh, you, you mentioned a character in the story that you called, quote, a young army captain, unquote. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. And it seems like if he knew more than we think he knew, he could have uh, maybe had knowledge of what was happening in both locations. So... There must be a little bit more that we should know about him, is there not? Well, I want to first tell you a story of uh, uh, a gentleman by the name uh, uh, Captain Michael D. Groves. Now, um, Michael Groves was head of the White House Honor Guard. He was the one that led the processions that weekend, the funeral procession. He was involved in every aspect of, of, of the caisson, bringing the casket down. You know, uh, the, the whole nine yards, the, the, this was a very important person in the scheme of things as far as, uh, uh, the white house and the honor guard and, and everything else. And about a week or so after the president is buried, that was the 25th of November, December 3rd, he's having dinner with his family and he just drops dead at the dinner table. Now. Uh, it was, it was said to be a heart attack. Supposedly he's been auto he was autopsy, but there's no record of any of that. Uh, they, they felt that Groves is important enough. If he can, if he can get this essay, he was, first of all, uh, uh, 
a Pennsylvania congressman gets on the floor of the House of Representatives and tells about the fact that Captain Groves had passed away, he said, from the stress of of the events of that weekend. You've got uh, a situation where his parents and his younger sister believed he was poisoned, he was killed. They did not accept the the military's uh, answers around the death whatsoever. Now, why would he be killed? Because it turns out the young army captain at Bethesda that day that dealt with uh, by Donald Rebentesh was Captain Michael D. Groves. And he, and, and, and Rebentesh, I didn't mention it to you earlier because I wanted to keep it for, to, to coincide with the story, but he was aware uh, um, of the death of Groves later on. And, and Rebentesh told me, I, I believe he also told uh, Harrison Livingstone when, when he was interviewed by him that, uh, that in fact they were all very upset at Bethesda that the young man they were dealing with had died just about a week later. So he obviously knew about the president's body being brought in, you know, uh, secretly earlier in the evening for the pre-examination, as we said, and all the things that took place at that point uh like you asked how much he knew about what happened in the new morgue after eight o'clock within the body was officially autopsied i can't i can't say i have no idea uh later on the evening where he was there's no you know most people have no idea he was even there even 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 james felder you know you know uh, couldn't believe, uh, you know, I was telling him, I didn't tell him about my suspicions about the death, but I told Felder that I believe that, uh, Captain Groves, who was his superior, uh, with the honor guard, um, uh, Captain Groves was dealing with the, the president's uh, arrival earlier in the evening. And he said, no, no way. You know, he was back at Fort Myer and, you know, he didn't believe it for a minute, but, uh, there's just too many people who seem to have been aware of the fact that it was Captain Groves. And um, and that he was there. So Groves either witnessed something. Uh, well, a lot of people witness things, but they were put under secrecy oath. And 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 to this day, most of them have never even talked about it, or don't even know the importance of what they were participating in. Um, but uh, uh, Groves maybe said something, or what he found out about after the fact didn't rest well with him. And he became a uh, a concern, the very very type of concern that uh, William Pitzer became. Uh, he here's here's a man who is handling materials that is showing the actual wounds to the president's body, photographic materials that that were taking place uh, at Bethesda, but these materials never surface ever again. They're never seen as part of the actual. Uh, you know, collection of autopsy photographs that people say is, is the president. And then on October 29th, 1966, the very day that the deed of gifts by the Kennedy family of the autopsy photographs and x-rays is given to the National Archives, pictures found dead of a gunshot wound to the head and lying on the floor of his office. And the Navy and the FBI worked really hard to make this look at the end of the day, like it was a suicide. He was depressed over something or whatever. Uh, But the circumstances that his body was found in, he was lying on the floor next to a a stepladder. And above the stepladder was a ceiling tile that was ajar. Leads me to believe that whoever came into Pitzer's office, and by the way, Pitzer's left hand was damaged to such a degree that the wife had, his wife Joyce had asked for uh, his wedding ring and they couldn't give it to her. They sent the son down to, 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 to try to retrieve, retrieve it. They said they couldn't remove it because his hand had, had been damaged. And to me, again, I'm speculating here, but whoever came into Pitzer's office and I believe shot him, uh, must have broken his fingers and done something to, to convince him that he, he had to, you know, relinquish these materials that he had had in his possession. Again, speculation, but, you know, suspicious nonetheless. If someone out there would like to sort of do their own research and, and sort of figure some things out about this angle in the case, what would you suggest? 
I would just recommend to anybody who's listening to this that has a passion for for understanding the subject and researching and, and going online uh, that that you that you locate these HSCA interviews with these various witnesses uh, that actually up until this point in our discussion tonight presented a real problem for many authors and many researchers and even people at the ARB um, who are trying to figure out how all these people's stories could fit into an event that happened in this one morgue, the morgue that we know to be the new morgue in Building 8. And stories like Lipsy's story and Knutson's story and, um, and, and various others uh, made no sense in the scheme of things because they were never seen, you know, at that morgue. Uh, and yet now, by having, like you said earlier, the existence of two morgues, two loading docks, two caskets, two bodies, two groups of men photographing and documenting the wounds on, on these bodies, so forth and so on, we now spread it out to a, to a puzzle that is now giving us a, 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 an image or a vision of what really happened that night. And it took 60 years for us to really put these puzzle pieces together. We don't have them all, but we have enough to realize this whole situation now has to be completely re-examined uh, as to what we thought went on and now what we think went on. You know? Before we wind down this evening, Rick, is there, are there any other characters? Is there any other aspect of the story? Is there any other angle that is vitally important that you think we absolutely need to cover first? Well, the one story um, that I think really uh, deserves to be, um, you know, looked at is um, Dennis David, the Pittsburgh uh, gathering in 1992. Well, one of the things that happened is those Fox photographs that Mark Crouch was kind enough to make a copy of for me. And I'm showing them to these, to these men, Jim Jenkins, O'Connor, uh, et cetera. And, um, and they're making comments about the fact, well, uh, the floor tile is not what we had at, at the morgue. Uh, the, the metal headrest on, that the head is resting on on the table, no such thing existed on the table that we had at the morgue. You know, so they're looking at these various things that they don't that are in the photographs that they didn't re- recall ever existing in the morgue they worked with at that point in time. And Dennis David, who hadn't really even spent time in the morgue, is looking at uh, one of the, one of the shots uh, of uh, I think it's a left profile that shows. Uh, um, you know, uh, the head in the head metal headrest and he blurts out that looks like the table at Namry. And then everybody went quiet. And for whatever reason, not knowing the, the importance of it, we just moved on to something else. But then I started to look into this and Namry, uh, was the Naval Medical Research Institute. And it was about a hundred yards. It was a building that was located about 100 yards behind the very back of Bethesda Naval Hospital. And it basically dealt with um, bioengineering and, uh, and, and looking into infectious diseases and various things of that nature. Uh, I'm not going to say it because I don't know it was biowarfare, but it was biological you know, research that was going down in, in this particular facility. But they were um, basically just doing autopsies and, and um, and surgery on animals. And so um, ultimately, uh, I tried to learn more about, uh, about this building, but uh, with very little luck. And then uh, the AARB interviewed uh, John Stringer, who was the photographer, the official photographer of JFK at his autopsy. And at the very end, he stated that, oh, by the way, I also photographed the autopsy of William Pitzer. And then Jeremy Gunn immediately shut the interview down and that was it. And then that reminded me about the fact that I had developed a relationship with the Pitzer, members of the Pitzer family. And I actually had uh, seen the fact that um, the autopsy photos of William Pitzer are done in the room with the floor tile, it was the exact same 
in the Fox photographs, the stair of death, which is the floor tile that O'Connor and Jenkins said didn't exist in their room. And the picture photograph, uh, autopsy photograph, it was the very first autograph, uh, auto, uh, photograph where he's still lying on the table, fully clothed. They haven't done anything yet. But there's a metal headrest that's swung completely around to the back uh, of the table because his head's resting on a chalk block, which any autopsy done is done on a ch- with a chalk block, certainly not some kind of circular metal headrest. But it showed that this table also had that headrest. So ultimately, this led me to understand that the autopsy of William Pitzer was actually done on campus at Bethesda, but because of the fact that it could very well have been a murder, it was done off book and not officially logged in to the point where his, his autopsy and the photographs of that autopsy were actually done at Namry, which now at least establishes the fact that the photographs that everybody had questioned, the Fox photographs, if you may, um, were not taken at the, you know, the, the new morgue, but were actually taken at, uh, at, at Namry. And, um, and that at least established for me uh, and something that I also showed in Dallas, you know, when you see the photographs uh, side by side of, of the Pitzer autopsy floor and the metal headrest with the stair of death photograph of Kennedy in the floor, um, they were both done in, in the same room. So we, we finally have an answer for the Fox photographs. And at the end of the day, I think this is important, ST. For years, people have been trying to reconcile all these items and things that we see, the nature of the wounds, the room, the table, this and that, in these so-called Fox photographs, which are now, we're told, are the official autopsy photographs that, that reside in the National Archives. And it's time to be able to come out and say, number one, this is not the president's body in these photographs. Number two, these photographs are not taken in the actual morgue uh, the President Kennedy was, was autopsied at. One last thing I did in Dallas, uh, which also I think is important, I think most people never even thought to do, is this one photograph, like I said, the left profile, and it has a phone on the wall behind uh, the body. And I took a photograph taken of, uh, of President Kennedy that day, Fort Worth, giving a speech, and I cropped it and inverted it so I could put it side by side with the head and the body on the table in that Fox photograph, the left profile, if you may. And, and, and the one thing, and I think I might've mentioned this to you before that people were able to determine the sixties besides fingerprints, if you wanted to try to determine a body, uh, an identifying trait would be the person's ear. And so by putting the Kennedy photograph from Fort Worth side by side with the t- body on the table and the Fox photograph and comparing the two ears, it wasn't even close. And it once again, establishes the fact that the body in these photographs was not the president. So they were fabricated and concocted by someone who was the Secret Service photographer, James Fox. In fact, I believe because they were in his possession and he developed them that he most likely was the one that went with that body uh, to Namry to take those photographs. And now I'm going to speculate one more time. And, and, and uh, people may think I'm being a little bit crazy here or conspiracy theorist, but I think it's viable that once this body, whoever it was that uh, I believe was picked up by Fox and his men, quote unquote, dead secret service agent was brought to Namry photographed to try to portray being the president on the table then that body was then put in the bronze casket that the uh, honor guard had been chasing for 40 45 minutes and then finally brought around to the side of the hospital the wall where the uh, honor guard caught up with it again and brought it in uh and it was that same body that not only was autopsied uh, that night but it also fox earlier in the evening uh had photographed I feel like this is one of those episodes that I'm going to have to listen to four or five times to really take it all in. I feel like I'm going to catch something new every time. Um, I want to, before we wrap this up, I want to go back and ask you about the men who killed Kennedy. A lot of us have seen that documentary. A lot of us have recordings either from YouTube or we recorded it on History Channel or we've we, we've somehow... I'm not going to say how, but we've gotten copies over the years. But um, 
it's hard to find commercially anymore. Oh, the only place, the only, the, only, the only place you can find it now, and thank God, uh, maybe maybe the network did this purposefully. Maybe they were not happy with the fact they were being pressured by Jack Valenti and Bill Moyers and G- President Gerald Ford and so forth and so on to remove the show. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been running on YouTube for many years now. And ordinarily, when you have something that you don't have the rights for and you put it on there, sooner or later, the copyright holder or the people that had the rights to, to it will complain to YouTube and they'll remove it. But the network has never done that. So in a way, that was their way of saying, okay, we've been pressured to, to no longer show or, or what must have pissed them off even more is the fact they couldn't sell DVDs or cassettes anymore, which was the most successful show for them at that time. And they were losing money on this deal. So because in 2000, I finally lost my rights. And, AIN, and at that point, History Channel picked up both the video rights uh, that I had to go along with episode six and episode seven, eight, nine that they had. Uh, so that way they could sell them all on, on DVD. So um, that's what happened to that. Rick Russo, I want to thank you so much for, for taking this time to uh, share your story. I know you don't share your story often, or not your story, but your research. I know you don't share your research often, uh, but you did recently speak in Dallas. And I think it's good for everybody to get a chance to hear you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I have to actually thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I don't know how long we went uh, uh, tonight with this, but but to, to really flesh out the story and go over all the details, because unfortunately in Dallas, there was a time constraint, and I was about the third of the way through when I was told, you got 15 minutes left, so I panicked and jumped to the end and, and, and didn't really give it you know uh, the time that it was due. And I know that we got into the tall weeds for a lot of people that maybe not knowledgeable about a lot of the nuances, uh, or uh, I guess the favorite word is minutia of this subject matter. But, but nevertheless, uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to really f- go through it A to Z with you, and, and hopefully we didn't lose too many people along the way. Take care. This has been Rick Russo, JFK, and Bethesda. I'm S.T. Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show. From the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. <laughs>